Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Rob Dell. I'm the 72nd president of, president of the Royal Society of Victoria and the first president not to be an eminent scientist. Um, the first 70 are on the wall in the corridor downstairs, including one that's over here sitting with us today, so thanks, Bill, for being with us. Uh, I do have some experience with science, though. Uh, to begin our day, may I invite Uncle Dave Wandon to offer a welcome to country. Welcome, Dave. Uh, it's a pleasure to come back here again. It's been a long time. This is the third time that I've actually been inside a building since COVID started. Mm -hmm. I'm very fortunate as an Aboriginal person to love being in the outdoors and having the opportunity to be out there and working on country. My name is Dave Wandon and I'm an elder of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung Tribal Land Council. On whose land you are gathered today? You are gathered on the land of my father's country. But of course it's my country today and it will belong to my children and my grandchildren and of course the children not yet born. And on that note, I pay my respects to my ancestors, my elders, both past and present, and our young people, which will become our future elders. For the knowledge that they have been able to pass down to me, that I can pass to my children and my grandchildren, and now my great-grandchildren, just turned four. Um, and I pay my respects to all other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples that are gathered with us today, to their ancestors and elders, and there's two in the room that I've worked with fairly closely over the last 10 years. And I'm paying my respects to them and their elders and their communities for being able to being allowed to walk their country and learn from them and vice versa. And we've actually discovered that the knowledge gaps we thought we had are not as broad as what we thought they were. We all have different gaps within our communities, but when we start communicating together, which we have been or I have been over the last 10 years, we find that there's so much collective knowledge. It's very much a basic principle, a guiding principle of what our culture really means. And that's why the welcome to country is so important. Because there are rules, not just when you go into someone's house, but there are rules when you walk on country. And we're here, you know, this is academia. I'm not an academic, but I am a scientist. But that's recognised by my mob. Because we are the first scientists of this country. We have been collecting data for more than 70,000 years. As we went out and gathered our daily resources that we needed, we were out there under our totemic system. And I'll give you an example. Uh, mine is the ring-tailed possum, but my grandson is the, uh, the powerful owl. You know, you think that should put us as loggerheads because he's a threat to my community, to my totem. But in actual fact, it only reinforces and strengthens our bond, that it strengthens my responsibility to my totem that I must make sure that I create an environment that supports and enhances a thriving population of the ringtail, knowing that they will be predated by the powerful owl. And of course, as my grandson grows up, he'll realise what the powerful owl needs. And so his responsibility will be to make sure that it has the habitat that it needs to survive, not just the ringtail possums, but everything else it needs for nesting material, the right type of trees and all those kind of, and that's why we have a totemic system. That's our connection to country because it's only by understanding country can you actually start to understand human behaviour and your community. Humans are the most complicated people in the world, the com complicated part of this world system that we've got. So to understand your community, learning from the plants and the animals and the water and the soils and the trees and the birds and the mammals and the marsupials and everything else that connects it all together gives you the strength that when you go through your initiation and you become a part of your community, that every time you come up against adversity, you can go back to what you've learnt from country and you can apply those principles to human behaviour. In that way, you encourage change, you encourage respect. And it's not because I want it, it's because I'm saying this is what my animal needs. And other people say that's my bird and that's my fish. And it's not that I'm against you, but what you're doing is you're harming not me, you're harming my totem. And amongst Aboriginal people, we respect that as we walk country. We don't talk on other people's country unless we're invited to. Um, and people say, what is a welcome to country? Um, and how does it work in today's society? But if you think about it, you all do a welcome to country in your own home pretty much every day, except you think of your home as having a roof. Our home has a roof, but it's the sky. And the walls are our boundaries. And anybody who comes into our home, we need to welcome them for many, many reasons. 
But primarily, we need to know who they are, we need to know what they're there for, and how long they're going to be for. So as they come into our country, if I was to go down and visit Damien, you know, he would say, OK, I've got Uncle Dave coming down, I need to put up, um, you know, find a spare room in my house or put him up in a motel, make sure that he's fed, show him where the good water is, maybe the best pub, who knows. Um, yeah, all these things that you do when you welcome people into your house, the first thing you do, you get a knock on the door, you open it, oh, hi, how are you? Yeah, you know the person. Come in. The first thing you do is offer them a cup of tea, just like when we all walked in here this morning. Our welcome has been the same for thousands and thousands of years, but your welcome is the same too. Just We approach it differently. But the rules are the same. Once someone enters your house, you take on the responsibility of caring for them. And under our law, Bunjil, our creator spirit, it's not just people coming onto country, it's everything that's in country that he gave us responsibility to care for. And for the you know, 170 years here in Victoria, we haven't been able to do that. And of course, now we're at that, this critical mass. And it's not all doom and gloom, but it's gonna be a long road to recovery. But if we go back to remembering from my creator spirit, Bunjil, who gave us all the laws of the land and our responsibilities, he gave us first law, and that is, you must respect your mother. Not only your physical mother that you are born from, who is the first person that you see as you enter the world, the first person you are connected to, who feeds you, clothes you, keeps you warm when it's cold, cools you down when it's hot, looks after you when you are sick, provides shelter and food. And as our physical mother grows older, and we grow older, and she struggles in her, in her old age, to do what she used to do. We return that favour to our physical mother. But the other side of the coin, the other 50%, is we must also respect the spirit of our mother as we do our physical mother. And of course for us, our, physical mo our spiritual mother is the land on which we live and work and play and rely on for our survival. And the land is old. And she has cared for our, our people for many, many thousands of years here in Australia because we did respect her and we cared for her, and we listened to what she tells us. We don't have a language, everybody knows that, it's not written down, but believe it or not, the language is out there. But only Aboriginal people can read it, because the language is there in the land. And that's what we call reading country. And it's not something you can learn in a university. You need to walk with us. And it's always my message. Let's walk country together, so we can heal country together. And once we heal country together, we can all call ourselves Australians, but best of all, when you heal country, you heal people and they are healthy. Healthy country means healthy people. That's why we have survived for so long, by keeping country healthy. And we adapted to country as we listened to the messages that the land was telling us. We didn't say in the climate change that we know that our ancestors went through here in Australia. Many ice ages the lakes drying out, the seas rising. You know, my dad tells the joke, you know, we don't go over and visit, we haven't visited the Tasmanian Aboriginals for many thousands of years, and we haven't done that since the back road got flooded. <laughs> you know, because you know, that's what we now call Bass Strait. And I used to think it was a joke, but I know that going up far north, uh, uh, past Cairns and meeting all the mobs up there is part of my work as a fire elder, uh, and listening to their stories, and they have those same stories about walking out to those islands. They remember when they were connected to the landmass. And that's where the new science that has been studied here for the last 200 years, but our science as well, can work together and we'll come up with a solution. There is no us and them, you and I. We are together because I know that we have been at loggerheads and that was just through colonisation. Things are changing. Reconciliation is a wonderful movement. It's got a long way to go. But I think when we all sit at home and we listen to the news and we read our papers, whether you're a scientist or you're a student at primary school, we all have the same goals. We want to leave something behind better, not just for our grandchildren, which we physically see in our great-grandchildren, but for those children that are not yet born. Make sure that we hand something back to them that's better than what we found it. Now, we'll never get it back to what it was 200 years ago in Australia. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't aim for those goals. But understanding that in the 200 years without colonisation, the landscape was changing and is changing. And it's how we monitor those changes 
in the remnant areas that we've got left. And that's why I love um, you know, doing archaeology and finding our huge scatter sites and the work that's been done down at Gunditjmara and Budge Beam. Our eel traps in the Yarra are such a mine of information that science can actually le learn from. And I'm amazed now that me, with a year 10 education, that I do work with a lot of scientists. Universities are calling me and other Aboriginal people in to say, what do you think about this? And they're listening now. If we had to listen 200 years ago and we had a cared for country and we had healthy country, we would not have had COVID. My take on COVID, well, for me, it was a great time for me. It gave me a chance to relax. Instead of working 10 days a week, I'm now back to eight days a week. <laughs> Because uh, that's the demand on our time, and we'll be talking about that later on. Mm. You know, now we're being asked to contribute, and we want to contribute, but you want too much all at once. There's a lot of relearning we have to do. There's a lot of testing we have to do. And, but I'm lucky to have the opportunity on my little 200 acres of land to do those demonstrations, to show how you can marry conservation with an economic farm how you can diversify your farm, improve your farm, not by putting more fertilisers and getting bigger machinery, but by micromanaging it. And that's what we did. We didn't wait for the disasters to happen. We went out every day, we observed what we did, and in the afternoon we went back to our elders, just like a research student goes back to their lecturer. They go out in the field, collect data, and they ask, what's the solution? And the lecturer, the professor, or the elder would help talk you through it, through that collective memory and you would come up with a solution. And you would go out the next day and you, you would apply that solution because we had time. We didn't have to work 50 hours a week. We only worked four hours a day for everything that we needed. Wouldn't we all like to go back to that? The rest of the time was about caring for country. And that's the commitment, not just us as scientists or Aboriginal people, but humanity has to make. We have to find the time to heal country. There are too many people out there who think it's the government's job. But it's not just the government's job. It's not just my job and my people's job. It's not just the scientist's job. It's only, as I keep saying, we need to walk country together, to learn from country together, so we can work out the best solutions. And I believe we do have the capacity to do that. Well, Minjika, Wurundjeri, Biak, welcome to Wurundjeri country, and thank you. Thank you, Uncle Dave, for that really strong message. I'm sure it will provide us a really strong spine and underpin our deliberations through today. You remind us about time as well. I also, as you were speaking, I do recall there was a, uh, Jenny Gray had a big powerful owl up in those lily pillies in the zoo. It was doing a very good job at maintaining a, a strict uh, population number on the ringtails in the zoo for a period of time. Uh, I am gonna have a crack at language too, mate, uh, because it's really important. So may I say, Nojkin Warui, Nojkin Wurui. Thanks for having us. I'm practicing that, but, uh, and we all should. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the first ever Royal Society Victoria Members Forum. You're part of a, a newly developed process uh, that will involve discussion and deliberation on what the Royal Society of Victoria's formal position should be on biodiversity conservation and recovery in the state. We will release our consolidated thoughts as a Royal Society of Victoria position paper in due course. We're delighted that there are so many of you here today. Uh, many of you have travelled. We're very thankful for your time. Uh, we have ecologists and paleoecologists, Indigenous and community group representatives, academics, NGO com campaigners, public servants, representatives of key agencies and state biodiversity asset managers, climate scientists and engineers, environmental lawyers, business people, and finance sector types, librarians, writers, medicos, bankers, society, society's fellows and members. We also have two astrophysicists, so pay attention. Thinkers of all types here today, and that's wonderful. So welcome to you all, and thank you again for your participation. Please consider, I'm, I'm now calling, we're in a renaissance uh, with this organisation, and this is a, a first big stepping stone for the, for the Royal Society to get back on its feet. And I talk a lot now about the need for collaboration, affiliation, and the need for us to push very hard to redevelop science-based decision-making in the state and if not the nation. Uh, to take you through what we're going to do for the rest of the day, please welcome your facilitator, Dr. Anthony Boxall, that I'm sure many of you know. Thanks. 
Uh, just a quick introduction. So I'm Anthony Boxshaw. I run a company called Science Into Action, which is effectively a, a science impact company. I work in that really murky space between science and decision making, predominantly in things that have public value, and mainly in the sciences, green environment, brown environment, and climate adaptation. Um, I'm actually a marine ecologist by trade, uh, and I'm a Melbourne Enterprise Fellow at the University of Melbourne, uh, a board member of Parks Victoria, and the chair of the Marine and Coastal Council. But unfortunately, while I'd love to be in the content today, because you can see I have a great interest, I'm in the process. So my job is to make the process work today. And so I'm going to be, you can hold me to that. If you see me drift into content, slap me back. <laughs> because I've got to stay on process because at least one of us has to because it's, it's such a wonderful room. Um, what's going to happen is effectively uh, we're going to mine your brains and your brilliance to get the stuff that's going to be the content of this position paper, as Rob has just said. So before I... Uh, oh, now, I will hand... What I'll do is I'll actually hand back to Rob because Rob is going to set the scene for the content and then I'm going to talk you through a couple of kind of process pieces and then we'll get to the fellows. So, Rob, back to you. Yep. So, um, this is a little bit of stuff you already know, but it serves us all well, if I do remind you. Um, over the last two months, a really dedicated team from the RSV and some of our fellows, and new fellows, four new fellows, have been working to develop uh, this thought starter for you. And we hope you've had a chance to at least go through it uh, a little bit. Uh, given the timing of the release, we thought it useful for you to have at least a, an ov overview of the scale of the problem so we can focus on the solutions. We're really looking at solutions today rather than dwelling and getting uh, maudlin about the, uh, about the problem rather than rather debating the problem. So my task, just to not so much give you the bad news, but at least reinforce the bad news uh, that you're already aware of. Uh, we do face a genuinely wicked problem. It requires urgent action. Uh, there are, we're working at a multiplicity of scales with multiple segments right across our society. And, this, and just recognising the complexity of this problem is a fundamental first step. None of you will be, need to be reminded, I just pulled a couple of images together uh, over the last few days to illustrate where we're at. There's, there isn't a lot of good news here. Uh, we've had a change of government. I personally hope that that really does, the dialogue's already changed, thank goodness. Uh, and we hope that uh, some of these issues uh, we, we might see uh, responded to by a federal government shortly. Um, th these graphs do not represent good news. Habitats are the key. Um, the legislation is failing us. Graham Samuel's here today and we'll hear from him in due course and I'm sure he'll confirm that. Uh, we have ex uh, other experts like Graham to discuss this as well. This is a, a fundamental problem uh, for, for Australia. Uh, if we need further reminding, entire communities are under threat, all these species are gone uh, and, there are, and there are many, many more that are at risk. Uh, this is important. This diagram's in the briefing paper, uh, just talking about the stresses, and this adds to the idea of the complexity. Uh, whereas we might say that the global warming problem has a solution, that is to reduce emissions, the, the challenge of the biodiversity crisis uh, really has no single stressor that can manage it. There's, not, there's, there's certainly no silver bullet here. It takes us back to the my, the initial point made that this is a, a seriously wicked problem with multiple sectors, multiple players, multiple stresses. Um, there are, oh, we just uh, put this in just recently and I used this a bit and thank you to Brendan for uh, providing us and reminding me. This is not, uh, this is from the World Economic Forum's analysis of global problems. So this is not ecologists telling us this, these are economists. And over the, with the exception of perhaps the pandemic in 1990 in their report in 2020, uh, where uh, pandemic disease became a major global issue, over the last, I think probably the last five years, always, there are five issues. So the, 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 the five green bars you can see there have been in their top ten. These are, the, these are the major issues that economists say face us in the world today. And they're either weather or biodiversity related. So really important. These are the five core public policy contexts. Uh, they're all in the briefing paper. 
uh, and they uh, each contribute uh, recommend recommendations and objectives for us today. So that's just to remind us all that this is a, a big problem, but it would be terrific uh, given the diversity and the capability in this group here, that if we can really build on the position paper that the team's been working on over the last couple of months, which I think is a terrific effort uh, to get to that to the, get the level and cover the bases that they have, but now to look at uh, evidence-based suggestions and solutions for how we go forward. Welcome, and uh, I'll pass back to Anthony. So our first fellow is, is Damien Bell. Damien is a proud Goodyear Jamara man. He's a current Atlantic Fellow for Social Impact and the former CEO of Goodyear Jamara, the traditional owner Aboriginal corporation. And so Damien, I'll pass you this, you this. Yep. and then when you start speaking, your 10 minutes start. Um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Rundry Country, thank Uncle Dave for the welcome. Um, I'd also like to speak in respect, uh, in respectful acknowledgement of my ancestors, Gunditjmara ancestors and my elders and my community and my country. I also acknowledge um, Monica Morgan in the crowd today. Um, she's taught a lot of us the hard way, but the deadly way. With the Royal Society of Victoria, when I moved home, I was born on country and uh, we went through a rough patch uh, as a community, so I had to come down to Melbourne for work when I was 18. Uh, by the time I was 30, it was all right to go back home again uh, because we had our native title claim. And we were also working on our, on, on our land, on our country, um, increasing our understanding of our country and how it works and our relationship with country. Um, we had a, a World Heritage uh, application to get in um, to UNESCO. I remember UNESCO freaking out a bit because they've never had a, um, a traditional owner, a First Nations group, uh, submit an application with their own land for uh, World Heritage before. Um, so we had to sort of make sure they were all right, because like I said, they freaked out a bit. But in getting that understanding of what, what univer outstanding universal values that our country had along the Budgeboom landscape, um, there was a lot of opinions. There was a lot of opinions, um, as you can imagine. Uh, to help us ground all those opinions into um, a reality, not only of our own Gunditjmara reality, uh, but the reality of the broader community, we'd always go to the, uh, uh, the reports from the Royal Society of Victoria, uh, people like Bernie Joyce, this one and that one, to sort of ground all those opinions about our country into what we're going to put forward. So just to acknowledge uh, Bernie and all that. Um, what we need is more land in this solution as part of the solutions uh, and traditional owners to, um, to hold that land. Uh, we need more national parks, Thank you and knowledge Matt here today. And uh, we need those parks to be returned to traditional owners. We need every, all that we can get, um, not only with um, the historical uh, impact that we've had from colonisation over the past 200 and something years, um, there's, there's, there's not a lot of land left um, in the public sphere uh, for us to look after. Um, people, it's always amazing when people talk about uh, Victoria and they talk about the national parks and managed reserves that we have have been remnant. And I think, oh, how, how can you sort of diminish it down that way? Because um, it is all that we have left. Um, it is still affected by, um, by modern life and the history that we've had over the past 200 years. It's still affected by climate change. Current planning. Uh, look, just to quickly go through cultural heritage in places, teaches about the environment, teaches about biodiversity, uh, water and flows, um, that's happening, although we sort of finally get some water allocated to traditional owners and that's when the water's drying up a bit. Or uh, massive cultural <coughs> entities uh, like the Murray River have been um, irrigated um, where it doesn't recognise the Murray River. It doesn't, you can't recognise it as the river. Um, anymore. The water's there, but the country's different, and there's a lot more people draw, um, drawing on it. Cultural burning and fire recovery, and we are very lucky to have Uncle Dave here today. Um, he likes to burn things responsibly and culturally. Um, but it is, it is such a culture uh, with, with cultural burning. After the uh, Black, fire, uh, Black Summer uh, bushfires, uh, we got called up to Canberra 
Um, I suppose it was all the places uh, that were registered for, with National or World Heritage. Um, the Minister, Suzanne Lee, with the oh, former minister now, uh, with the koalas that were up there, she pulled everyone together. And it was really surprising walking into the room to see uh, cultural burning people in there as well. The fire sticks people from up, up that way. They were in the room and it was a shock, a surprise, a wonderful surprise to see them invited by the, in the room by the Australian government and also even deadlier was all those national world heritage places um, immediately gravitating towards those people. With the Black, Saturday, uh, Black Summer bushfires, um, we had the human loss, we had the biodiversity loss um, and places, we had rock art scorched off the stone. That's what we had. So that to respond to that, um, you've got to get through your own broken heart, um, your own broken mind. And I think the way uh, Rob and Tony, Anthony pre um, presented what we've got to do, plus Dave's welcome, um, gives us a lot of spirit to do that. Uh, Biodiversities and forests, marine and coast, cultural landscapes, traditional languages. And in Victoria, again, what we have today is so profound. We live in this state that colonised our country, that um, decimated our people, that took our language, but we have survived. And today in 2022, we have a First Peoples Assembly working towards a treaty for Victoria. Who could have thought? Who could have imagined? It still freaks me out, because I still think they're going to come and round us up. Um, to, 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 to get rid of us. I still have that as a modern uh, Gundij Mara person with work in not only my own community, but communities right across the country. We have this truth telling happening, which is going to be so profound again. Um, this is the environment that we have in Victoria. This is the environment that gives us all um, that bravery to do something about biodiversity, to challenge the lost sets there. I wanted to talk about what our people do, our country plans across the state. Um, what isn't on here is the dozens and dozens of uh, co-management plans that go across the um, state that uh, traditional owners have worked out with, uh, with parks and with DELP, uh, who are very important partners and tools for what we need to do on biodiversity. Um, and also Uncle Arthur Isla, which is always deadly. Yes, um, we've done some good things. Um, that voice, that understanding, that perspective from our traditional owners are there, they're ready to engage. The most important thing is the voice of traditional owners for traditional country being engaged with your science. It's very important. If you don't have that authenticity, that relationship, it's not going to work. Um, my final thing, you've heard of Indigenous protected areas. Yep. Oh, well done. About a third of yours. <laughs> we got some work to do. Indigenous protected areas are the best thing on earth, uh, in my opinion. The Indigenous estate makes up 20% of the Australian land mass. About 3% of, uh, of that is Indigenous protected areas. It's where Indigenous uh, uh, communities, whether it's uh, uh, land under their own title or, uh, or other public land, the mob sit down, they discuss it, they declare an Indigenous protected area that gets the Commonwealth going um, and uh, that the, how IPAs, Indigenous protected areas, are managed is um, um, under the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, those categories there. So not only is it the mob uh, managing it according to their laws and customs and their contemporary realities and the future for climate change we have, you can see the, 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 the amount of um, um, IPAs there are across Australia. You can see how much there isn't in Victoria. Well, even these have got a heap. Uh, we do have IPAs down in the southwest. Um, just to note up in Hay, and I know in the paper we talk about the case study for Ned's Corner, we've got this amazing story of Trust for Nature, who for a long time I wouldn't trust, but they're getting ready to hand back 30,000 hectares of country to the mob up there, ready to share that story about how to look after it and how to restore it. Um, it's, it's amazing. So well done for Trust for Nature. And it serves for a model 
for all of, all of us not to get over our own prejudices, but to focus on country, what needs to be done. 85 million hectares, and in Victoria we have 3,600 covered. 2,600 are from my community on Gwinnidge Mountain. Well, it's all Gwinnidge Mountain country, really. Um, us mob and the Fram mob. We're all family. But we need to spread that out. Um, to me, it's a tool, it's a challenge. People freak out, oh, you know, national parks, giving them back to blackfellas. Yeah, well, it's already happening. Uh, Aboriginal title under the Traditional Owner Settlement Act, that's there. But there's always room for innovation and for the self-determination of um, not only us as traditional owners, but for country. Um, I know this talk's been a lot about um, the political science that goes into it and the reality on the ground to what's happening. Uh, I wanted to end on, uh, back in 2008, for people who know Jeff Carr, he's a botanist, um, we had the fortunate, um, uh, we had the, it was great fortune for Jeff to come down on our country along the Budgebeam uh, landscape, which is the stony woodlands. Um, that's the world's oldest and most extensive agriculture system in the world. Uh, we work with Jeff, we work out, we did about a survey, a botanical survey of about 90 quadrants up and down the landscape. Um, that was in 2008. We published all that. Uh, we, this year we have now have the great fortune again. Jeff's still around. He's back down on country going to, uh, uh, to check those, um, those 90 quadrants out. Um, I seen him last week. I said, oh, how's it going? You know, we're Indigenous protected area, this and that. Um, he goes, he looks very dire, Damien. I said, what? I said, what are you doing, Jeff? He said, even though we recorded those quadrants coming out of the millennial drought, millennial drought last, uh, in 2008, even though we've restored Lake Conda, even though we have that landscape protected by the highest protection in the world with the UNESCO World Heritage, even though uh, we've, we've, we've tr uh, treated the koalas um, to reduce them from uh, 13,000 down to about 9,000 now, um, it still looks dire. We had bushfires through there. We've had that opportunity for, oh, the bushfires we had in uh, Black Summer. Um, while the west of Australia burned, it was like our ancestors were doing a cultural burn. We were sitting there at the mission watching it, and it was low, didn't get in the canopies, and we were sitting there, oh, you know, what if ancestors moved the fire over there a bit? And, Amazing. It reveals so much more to us about our country. Um, yes, even though we have everything that you can imagine what country needs from a human perspective in regards to protection, us as Gundij Mara people, as traditional owners, it's still looking dire. It's unreal. It's scary. And we really need to, um, um, to uh, uh, enlist what we have for the Royal Society of Victoria to battle the big problem with little approaches, but smart approaches. But I'll, I'll sit in now. Oh, good, no questions. Oh, cool, all right, cool. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a little, you are tall, aren't you? Jeez. Um, we, we've got about a minute or two for a couple of questions of clarity. Oh, deadly. Jane here. What's the main barriers to IPAs in Victoria? Um, they might not, but the Victorian government, yeah, um, to open it up. It's okay. The sky won't fall in. You build everyone up. Um, but again, that voice of, um, of First Nations need to come through to do direct that. The Commonwealth, as you can see, um, they love an IPA. Um, yes. Thank you. I might ask one quickly, Damien. Yep. Um, how, do the, how do you resource it or fund it? Um, through the, the, the sheer determination and legacy that your ancestors gave you to look after country, uh, everything happens. We, everything starts out in the shed, um, but as it grows and as you see how uh, your community's work can link up with those international obligations that Australia has, that the state of Victoria has, uh, yeah, it falls into place. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank cool. you. Thank, Thank you, you Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, let's let's thank Damien. Here.
Very excited to have Fern Haynes, who's the current director of Arthur Ryla, uh, the Arthur Ryla Institute, as Damien mentioned Arthur Ryla before, um, for environmental research at the Department for Environment, Land, Water and Planning. Make sure I get that right. So Fern, I'll pass over to you for your 10 minutes. Thank you, Anthony. And what a collection of people. It's amazing, isn't it? It's so good. So thank you for that and um, really good to be here. I want to talk about joining the dots. Before I do that, I'd like to also respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, the Woiwurrung, Boonwurrung people, Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Um, I pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging leaders and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are with us today. Good to have you here and thank you for the welcome, Uncle Dave. I'd also like to acknowledge that we're in Wurundjeri Wurrung season, wombat season. So we might see wombats out wandering around. It's getting a lot colder. The tree fern hearts are providing good food. And we can hear the lyrebirds calling and see them displaying. I hope you can hear them. I'm grateful for the generations of knowledge and observations that have helped us know that about this Wurundjeri season. I'm grateful for that knowledge being observed and collated and shared. I'm grateful for that being collected and shared with us today. This knowledge, I want to talk a lot today about knowledge. Knowledge is our currency at ARI. And I'm going to think of ARI as Uncle Arthur Ryla from now on. I love that. <laughs> it's our currency. It's, um, it's what we create. It's what we store. It's what we share. It's what we provide to people to make decisions about the natural world around us. It's how we contribute to Biodiversity 2037. It, it's what we do. And the people that we have at ARI are deeply knowledgeable, passionate, committed to making a difference in the world for, for, um, and, and to public service. So knowledge is a big part of what I want to focus on today. And if we think about the problems that have been revealed to us in the last months and through the paper as well, knowledge is a big part of that. For example, a lot of them, those problems that have been identified are around things like data. We don't have enough data, we don't have current data, we don't have great targeted ways of monitoring the things that we're learning and doing. These are, these are data and knowledge questions. We also have questions around resourcing. If we could solve that one, we could probably solve the knowledge one. Those things are a kind of a given. We need to pay attention to those things. But the world also has bigger problems. You know, in the global context, We've got a whole lot of other things happening that I think we really need to think about if we want to transform how we and, and achieve the goals that we need to for our society and environment. Um, we need to think about these bigger things and what we're going to do. So we've got these issues around this legacy of environmental degradation going back more than 200 years in, in Victoria. We've got a disengaged community, partly because of increasing urbanisation. We've got this emerging mistrust or erosion of trust in science and in some places in government. We're late to the recognition of the role of Aboriginal people and the notion of country and what it can mean and the leadership there. We are late to recognising that. And we have this wicked problem context around all of these things and joining them all together. So how can we be transformative and make really transformative change in what we need to do? Because we've been chipping away at things for a while now and things aren't getting any better. I think we need to completely reframe our relationships with knowledge and with science and with environment and country. We need to look at things differently. When I think about science and knowledge from an Uncle Arthur Rala perspective, you know, we've, for 52 years now, we've been doing science to inform decision-making around the environment in Victoria. <coughs> All kinds of things. Um, it's great to have Andrew in the room here today because Andrew actually wrote our first technical report. 
Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> and in between then and now, we've done lots of work on all kinds of things. Inbreeding depression of helmet and honey eaters, artificial intelligence um, around all sorts of data from camera traps and audio traps. We created a lot of the tools that we've now transformed into modern tools that we use. So we created atlases and indices that have now become the VBA. We created tolerable fire intervals, you know, lots of those tools that we use to understand and make decisions about what we do today. Things around fire, koalas, lead beaters, possums, advice these days into the renewable energy industry that's just, you know, exploding across this state. So lots of things that we're involved in. But it's not okay to just do that science and have it sit in a report on a shelf. Andrew again, I didn't know Andrew was going to be here. He's like a feature person today. But we, Andrew's led this work and we have thought deeply about how do we actually transform that science into impact? What is the pathway to impact? How do we get from a set of environmental problems to positive environmental change on the ground? There are lots of levers and intersects here that we really need to think about to ensure that the science that we do makes a difference, that the science that we do matters and has impact. So in thinking all about this, we've identified there are actually four key enablers. Now this looks simple, and you might read that, that and think, oh yeah, sure, I kind of knew that. But there's a lot under each of these words. These words are really important. The quality of our engagement and relationships and the enduring nature of those. The credibility and reputation that we hold, so people trust the science that we do, and they come to us for the science that we do that we're providing relevant, applicable knowledge. It's targeted, it's answering the right questions. And that we're effectively communicating it and sharing it. So not just for us at Arthur Rala, but everyone who's generating science and wanting to share it. These are really important things that we need to address. And in thinking about science and knowledge, what is knowledge? What do we mean when we're talking about the knowledge that we need, the science that we need, in the contemporary way that we work with the environment in Victoria? Uncle Dave and others have already said that we need to grow and strengthen our partnerships with traditional owners and Aboriginal organisations in this country. We've got long-standing relationships with some and we're doing some exciting and amazing work, including with Gundu Jamara and, and others work on eels, turtles, mussels, plants, all sorts of things. This is fabulous work and I'm really proud of it. But we need to deepen how this is done. We need to better connect our knowledge systems. We need to make this more business than usual rather than a subset of what we do. This is part of how we need to operate into the future in a genuine partnership way. I'm really excited about this work. So. We're working with Maddie Miller and great to see Mick McCarthy here today. Mick, myself and Kath Williams are all co-supervisors of Maddie um, with Melbourne Uni. Maddie is exploring how do we do this? How do we meaningfully bring together different ways of knowing place? How do we do that in a way that respects the integrity of each and creates something new and powerful and amazing that transforms us into a new space? And how do we use storying as a method to do that? I'm excited about that and I want to see it feeding pretty much into everything else that we do. Another kind of science, behaviour change. Now, Arthur Ryler Institute has this massive history and legacy around ecological research, but increasingly we're exploring behaviour change. Now, if you think about Biodiversity 2037, one of its goals is that Victorians will value nature. It's about behaviour change, right? It's about getting people to value, connect and act for nature in meaningful ways. How are we going to do that? Like, I'm sure everyone in this room would have ideas about what we might do, but how do we do that in an impactful way that is evidence-based? So we work with Monash and Behaviour Works and Icon Science at RMIT 
and others to get evidence into this. We've been surveying the population across Victoria for three, now, three years now to better understand where we're at, who in Victoria is connected and acting for nature. How do they do that? What are they doing? When are they doing it? Why and why not? How do we measure connection? Which actions do we want to encourage people to do? So we're doing all of this work with an evidence base to inform not just what we do, but what our partners do as well. And we've fed that evidence into things like the annual Nature Festival. And the beauty of the Nature Festival is not just that it gets people to connect and act for nature, but that, that it is a demonstration of collective action and collective impact. And my question is, what shall we do next? What's the next thing that we apply the behaviour change lens and the collective impact lens to make a difference? So I want to join the dots. I want to join up the different sciences, the different knowledges, how we tell the stories, how we have impact, and how we work together for collective impact and connect the sector. Because biodiversity is in trouble. We need all hands on deck. We need to join things up, more partnerships, more participation, more democratisation of science by building citizen science. We need greater science, trust and valuing and impact. We need to bring together those different knowledges and have a mainstreaming of reciprocity of our relationship with nature. Get behaviour change science linking in with our ecological science and others. Join those dots. I'd love to see a nature knowledge network. And we need to tell the stories in a way that celebrates the successes, is evidence-based, is people-centred and trauma-sensitive, building hope and agency. To borrow the theme from National Reconciliation Week, be brave, everyone here, be brave, make change. Because there's that classic quote that you know, everyone uses, if not now, when? And if not us, who? It's the people in this room that we can make this transformative difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fern. I do love when people talk about science impact pathways. <laughs> it's wonderful. So, has anyone any questions of clarity for Fern? Hi, Fern. I just want to tell a little story of when I started doing some work with the ARI. And I remember my first ones to come in and talk about fire. And um, I spoke for about an hour and a half and I had so many of the, the members of Arthur Ryla come up to me afterwards with a, with a million questions. But the biggest question that came up was, where is your documentary evidence? And I struggled with that because I still work on that oral passing down of knowledge. And it's taken me a long while to realise exactly what you started off talking about data collection and how really important it is if we want to preserve knowledge. But the other one is the communication of those data sets when they're developed that have a, a, a tangible or an intangible result. And I know just at the start of COVID, um, I'd organised a walk or a group of people had organised a walk with David Cameron. Um, and myself at a very, very small reserve. If you put more than 30 people in it, you're going to destroy it. Um, and it was, of course, COVID and everything stopped. And I adapted to Zoom very quickly and I said, well, why don't we do it on Zoom? We'll do a reality show. And we ended up having uh, 140 people sign up. <coughs> and what came out of that, while we were hoping to educate 30 people, we ended up educating 140. But what we discovered from that was I was talking from my oral knowledge, whereas David came, as sci and there's nothing wrong with this, scientists talk in Latin. Mm. And the statements we got back at the end of that presentation, which was only supposed to be an hour and it went for nearly three because people just wanted to hear more and more. But the one thing that stood out in the statements at the end of it was people said, oh, now I understand what David Cameron is talking about because he's talking it in science and that frightens a lot of people. Mm. But then as David was saying it in science, I was interpreting it into common language, if you like, and people were starting to understand. They said, now I'm not afraid to go out and work in nature. 
So this is a communication we've, we've got where people do say, you know, oh, science and the government will take care of that. How do we convey that knowledge to the common person in, in a language that they can understand to give them the confidence and the power and the, uh, the reliance, the self-reliance to be able to go out and do, there are a lot of people who want to do stuff but don't really know how to go about it and they think they have to have a degree. So, yeah, communication is very much key. Yeah, it's, it's, it is. But I do want to respond because I want to say I love that you used a story to demonstrate the power of story. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> um, completely agree. And, you know, I spent many years working in science communication and engagement and how do we powerfully engage people with knowledge and ideas and understanding and experience. And story is one of those key things. Um, experience is another one. And you're totally right that most people that we ask, would you like to do something for nature? Yeah, I do, but I don't know where to start. I don't know how to start. I don't know how to find out what to do. So we need to engage those people. Yeah, thanks. Brilliant. We're going to, we're going to keep moving if that's okay. So um, our, our, the next fellow we'll hear from is Judith Downs. Um, aside from now being an extremely successful um, non-executive director of an impressive set of companies and the chair of Bank Australia, who's actually a mathematician by training. So I just found that out the other day. Um, so Judith, I welcome you up to, to present your 10 minutes. Thanks for that introduction, Anthony. And. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to be involved in this important initiative of the Royal Society of Victoria. And I'll start just by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging, and thank Uncle Dave and Damien and other Indigenous people for joining us today and making us welcome. It's a pleasure to address such an eminent scientific audience. I'd like each of you to take a moment and to imagine you're standing in my place and that your audience is a group of eminent bankers. <laughs> now you know how I feel. <laughs> At present, it's hard to find direct action by non-agricultural businesses to protect biodiversity. Yet we're all impacted by the degradation of the natural environment. Business increasingly accept the science of climate change and it's responding with direct action to reduce emissions and assist with the transition to clean, clean energy. However, the business focus on biodiversity is limited. Today's forum recognises that a corporate sector solution is needed to assist with halting the decline in biodiversity. Using academic research, the knowledge of the traditional owners of our land and working with government, Business needs to increase its contribution and devote more resources to this task. Today I'm going to look briefly at the Bank Australia Conservation Reserve and then consider potential projects that might encourage more participation from business. Bank Australia regularly surveys our customers and asks what environmental and social issues they feel most strongly about so that we can act on those issues. And for some time, the results have been incredibly consistent. Number one is climate change. Number three, biodiversity and protecting threatened species, ranking third. Affordable housing comes second. It's environmental and social as far as the bank goes. So our conservation reserve is a response to those customer priorities. Our activities on the reserve include managing fire and invasive weed risks, and working with traditional custodians, the Berenji Gadjan Land Council, to embed First Nations management and culture into the activities on the reserve. We also partner with Trust for Nature and Greening Australia, who work with us to revegetate areas with natural native vegetation, while responding to what science tells us might happen with climate change. Our activities also aim to support and increase the population of threatened species of plants and animals. Each year we report on our progress against targets in our long-term plan. 
The activities of any business have unintended consequences for our natural environment. However, that's not generally recognised by the business. For our bank, examples of the impact are funding the construction of homes on vacant land uh, or emissions from the homes that our mortgages fund. Our ownership of the Conservation Reserve acknowledges this impact and our responsibility to play a role in developing solutions. However, standards and knowledge about the broader environmental consequences of the financial services sector are still maturing. There's little understanding of or attention paid to the impacts of biodiversity. Measurement and disclosure are a precursor to understanding the implications of our actions on the natural environment. A commonly agreed framework for measurement of the impact of biodiversity loss is needed to encourage business, philanthropy and private investment to become more involved in solutions. The absence of an agreed set of metrics and slow, low-cost tools for data collection is a challenge for everyone at the moment. A second issue, and this is something Fran um, co commented on too, is that people and organisations can feel they don't have the ability to have an impact. While aware that there's a problem with the long-term sustainability of our environment, they may be unwilling to invest resources without advice from a trusted source or to identify a worthwhile project. Now, you all interact with businesses every day as you go about your life, and businesses can have an impact. Without going into solution mode, I'm going to throw some ideas at you and ask, why don't you encourage, encourage those businesses that you interact with to do some of these? Firstly, our reserve, it's a working model. It's been working since 2008. Other corporates, larger corporates, could replicate and adapt it to fit their own circumstances. This is a long-term project. Once you own land, you're committed to it for life. There are three other short-term actions that organisations can take. Businesses that are now considering action on climate change could explore opportunities to connect addressing climate change with biodiversity conservation. Another opportunity is to partner with organisations who pri provide scientific and technical input into the development of measurement and data collection activities. And a third very simple option is to select a project that, that is promoting restoration and conservation of biodiversity. As an example, over the past two years, Bank Australia has been a major partner of the Half Cut campaign, which helps to save threatened land in the Daintree. We provided information on this campaign to our customers, and our customers and staff have donated almost half a million to date. Approximately one out of every 15 of our customers has donated to that project. There are specific areas of research which would really help business. First, an exploration of why would a business invest in a biodiversity project? How can a business case be presented for this? There are three components to the business case tangible economic outcomes, tangible biodiversity outcomes, and intangible outcomes. The tangible economic outcomes arise from a re reduction in negative impacts from floods, bushfires, soil degradation, to name just a few, and possibly from carbon and biodiversity markets. The tangible biodiversity outcomes, such as, uh, uh, such as recovery and protection of species, add to the value created. And the final value, which is intangible, is something we experience at Bank Australia. And that's the value of taking a corporate leadership position that attracts customers and employees to your business. The business case would start with the significant and growing body of research that seeks to demonstrate the contribution of biodiversity and ecosystem services to society. The research would aim to use existing data to demonstrate why corporates should value and invest in nature. A business case for one or two projects would lay the foundation for business leaders to understand what measures they can take to invest in nature in a ways that counter the impact of their business. The second proposal touches on something Fern and I have both talked about, which is the lack of knowledge. And I think there are many community groups and small, small to medium-sized businesses that would be involved in conservation if they understood how to remove some of those barriers to entry. People often recognise a problem in their area, but they don't know how to address it. They don't know how to contact 
the government bodies, the scientific bodies, the academics, that can give them assistance. So developing some sort of standard templates and even better communicating those throughout the community could make a huge difference here. And the last thing I'm going to do is, is go back to being a banker. I am a banker. Our customers at the Bank Australia want action on biodiversity. And I actually believe that a large portion of the Australian population feel the same way. So our customers are involved in biodiversity action through our conservation reserve. How do they do this? Well, the first step's easy. They join the bank. We have visible targets so they can see exactly what we're doing over regeneration, protection, conservation and working with communities. We report regularly on the progress to them. We use social media as well as annual reports. And our project is managed scientifically with our partners. So it's an easy contribution, visible targets, regular reporting, and managed scientifically. Those are features that make contributing to a good cause very easy. So here's an idea. It's a funding proposal. I'd like to see these criteria spread much around a much wider group. So mechanisms are available to provide bank customers with the option of contributing small amounts regularly to specific funds. The average Australian makes over 600 electronic banking transactions a year, and small contributions could be linked to specific types of such transactions. Would our Victorians be willing to make an automatic contribution to a biodiversity fund each time they make a direct debit from their accounts? Would the option for such an easy economic transaction, applied to improving the planet on which we live, appeal to a large number of people? Would the biggest contributors to carbon emissions, which recent research tells us are the high socio-economic status people, respond to an option of giving small amounts regularly to a fund where allocation monies were managed by an organisation such as the Royal Society of Victoria? They're questions I've been pondering since being involved with this project, and the view, views of this forum on these questions will be most informative. In closing, I'd like to highlight the two actions that potentially might have significant impact. The first of these, develop a business case for some two, one or two biodiversity projects. And the second, provide an easy, reputable way for Victorians to believe that they too are contributing to funding biodiversity projects. And thank you for your time. I look forward to our discussion. Thank you so much, Judith. Um, are there any questions for clarity for Judith? A quick one. Is there anything that would um, get in the way? Because you've got significant partnerships working on the, on the, the conservation project. As, and as you say, you're putting it out there as a kind of a, a test project for other businesses, other banks, other yeah, others in the financial sector to take up. Is there anything that would get in the way of that being uh, an Indigenous protected area as well? It was something I was thinking about when um, Damien was talking about it. It costs a fair bit of money for the works that we need to do there because we have a responsibility to the local communities, the adjo adjoining farmlands. Um, that is something we're prepared to fund. How that would fit with an IPA, I do not know. Um, we're very keen to work with the Baranjagunjin people, and we do. Um, so I, I have to leave that as an open question, but it, yeah. Thanks, Judith. That was really good. Uh, James Todd from uh, uh, Delp Biodiversity. Um, I'm interested in how what the model you've taken here in terms of targets and regular reporting and <clears throat> managed scientifically, how, how you think it might feed into um, the reporting under Bio 2037. So how do we start to grow the same sort of metrics and and account for the contributions that might come from right across the sector, not just government, but more broadly? Mm. The targets, I think, from what I recall of reading it, and it's a little while since I read um, uh, Bio 30, uh, 2037, I think the targets are, are fairly clear, but I think you need to stage gate them to get sort of business involved. So too far out and people think, well, I won't be around then. 
you know, be moved on to something else. Um, regular reports, that's an, an easy one, uh, and I know, Fern, you have responsibility for it, but regular reports against progress on targets, but also breaking, the, breaking it down into something that's more manageable, um, I think is important. The, the ease of contribution is probably the hardest one, unless you can break it down into small projects and say, we are looking for a business that's operating in this area or that has customers in this area. Here is something we would like you to contribute. If, if you could break it down into that sort of small project, you, you really need to help businesses understand and say to them, this is a target. This is about how long it'll take, you know, three to five years, something like that. We need this sort of funding. We need you to mobilise your customers and your community for this sort of time commitment over the period. That might be one way that you could break down that very large, um, ambitious program into something that fits more like that. Remember, business thinks in terms of targets. It's not all that long term. Three to five years, most business strategic plans are about it. And so breaking it down into that sort of you know, targeted, small, and telling business what they need to contribute would be my suggestions. Thank you. Thank, join me in thanking Judith and we'll... Uh, last but certainly not least is Professor Brendan Wintle. Brendan is the former director of the National Threatened Species Recovery Hub and is a current professor of conservation biology at the University of Melbourne. Brendan, your 10 minutes. Thanks, Anne. I know he was very specific with me about my timing. I um, wonder why. Um, I am very fortunate and privileged to uh, live and work on Wurundjeri country, so I'd just like to start uh, by acknowledging that and paying my respects to Wurundjeri elders past, present and emerging. I'd particularly like to thank Uncle Dave for the uh, inspiring and I'll have to say, intimidatingly eloquent. Um, <laughs> welcome to country. Thanks so much, uh, Dave. That was uh, amazing. Um, I'd also like to thank the Society uh, for inviting me in as a member, um, as a fellow, I should say. Thanks, Rob and, um, and Mike, for that privilege, and also uh, for the privilege of being at this incredibly uh, crucial forum today. This is um, right at the uh, at the very heart of my uh, of my work and, and in a way my my meaning of life and so um, thank you for hosting such an important forum also I want to thank um, Rob and uh, Mike and Anth for relieving me of the uh, duty of just saying how terrible biodiversity crisis is and the extinction crisis um, all of my natural instincts uh, asking me to just go back and reflect on, you know, the loss of of, uh, of 100 species since European invasion, the, the 1,800 species on our list, but I'm just not going to. Thank you so much for uh, for that introduction about the problem. I'm uh, I'm asked to talk about opportunities, low hanging fruit, uh, and so I'm going to start with uh, some of the fruit that's lowest hanging. No surprises to anybody in the room that. Whilst climate change is, you know, probably thought of in the public uh, and certainly in the, uh, amongst politicians now, uh, thanks to uh, Saturday week ago, uh, as the existential crisis of our time, uh, it's it's all it's it's probably only just ahead or maybe just behind. Uh, the biodiversity crisis, the extinction crisis, in my mind, as the key uh, existential threat. Uh, it's also an opportunity for biodiversity. And, and I'm sure many of you already work in the space uh, of leveraging climate uh, mitigation and climate adaptation opportunities towards the benefit of biodiversity. And the obvious thing is biodiverse restoration uh, in order to sequester carbon to offset uh, the emissions of uh, large carbon emitting industries. Uh, this is something we actually, it's, it sounds so easy, it's of course not that easy. Reconstructing ecosystems is incredibly difficult, uh, but you can gain some biodiversity benefit through just establishing a canopy, by establishing a canopy in a mid-storey, by using the species that are best adapted for this place, which is usually the species that uh, exist there already, but sometimes it's other species because the environment is changing. And there's some wonderful work by CSRO and Bush Heritage Australia um, 
uh, out just west of Bendigo on the, the Nardu Hills Reserve, where they're actually adapting the provenances of the grey box and the yellow box to bring them from places that are hotter and drier. And they're actually seeing those provenances do better uh, in their Nardu Hills Reserve uh, than the, the provenances of the eucalypts that that were there on site uh, already. So this kind of agility and adaptability represents uh, a huge opportunity, I think. We have to be careful with the carbon and biodiversity thing, the sort of, if you like, the, the, the add-on of biodiversity is uh, can be a feel-good thing. We have to make sure that we actually measure the biodiversity benefits properly and well and robustly, and we've got to certify those measurements. So there's a whole bunch of measurement um, ideas and clarity, certification methods and other things we need to set up to make sure that this is actually done properly and that the benefits to biodiversity are tangible and transparent and available for everybody to see. We've got to get this right culturally as well. There's a whole, um, whole bunch of important reasons why uh, we need to um, be very careful about uh, involving and providing leadership and um, empowering uh, traditional owners to lead this where they where they want to uh, so that the things that we do in this country are actually respecting the country and are respecting the history of the country and the people who uh, managed it for 100,000 100, years uh, before we got here and started to wreck it all. So that leads me to, I think, what is my second most obvious low-hanging fruit uh, opportunity for the day. There's only four, so um, we'll move through them fairly quickly. I think two-way learning and supporting uh, traditional owners, empowering traditional owners in, in uh, cultural land management is a huge opportunity. Um, thanks, Damien, for already uh, raising the Neds Corner story. I think that's a, a, a great new story for us to, to focus on uh, uh, and to recognise what's possible and what's sort of already being uh, thought about and done uh, in this room. I think that's that's a really great story. Um, I just wanted to, to show this picture of um, Anya Stroblin and um, Gladys Bidu and Pamela Jeffrey up in Matu country. These are two uh, elders and rangers on Matu country who were working with Anya at the invitation of the Matu people to help them design uh, the monitoring programs to uh, see how Bilby are responding to uh, cultural fire and also to um, and predator control in that country. And this is an example of, uh, I won't go into the details, but where uh, the knowledge, the ways of knowing were coming together to help us do actually a better job uh, and engaging local people because we were, uh, we were working with the way they wanted to talk about country and record what was happening on country, not just the way the white fellow scientists who were coming in wanted to do it. So this is a great story, happy to expand on that later. And just to reiterate Damien's point, um, more than 44% now uh, of the national reserve system is actually IPA, um, but not more than 44% of the funding for the national reserve system goes to IPA. So some really basic things that we can do about redressing imbalance in terms of uh, the acknowledgement of the importance of, of uh, IPAs in, in, uh, in the <coughs> conservation estate in Australia. Um, and of course, you know, that over 42% of the country there is uh, native title uh, rights. So uh, a huge um, opportunity for us to learn and do better uh, in terms of land management on a huge part of the country. This is such a rich space, this engagement and bringing political will space. Um, it's sort of almost daunting to talk about. Fern did a wonderful job of set, setting out some of the key aspects of it. Um, I just wanted to highlight a, a little project here that we had under the Threatened Species Hub about helping bring curriculum into primary schools in Victoria uh, that was teaching local uh, students about the culturally significant species in their place. This was work actually led by Sarah Beckersey and Georgia Garrard at RMIT. Um, with, uh, were you invite, involved in that project, Uncle Dave? I, I know that we that there was... Yeah, yeah, of course. So there was that... Uh, yeah, a lot of um, leadership there from from your mob uh, in in setting up the the program in that in the first case study school. It's a great opportunity. All of the kids have done pre and post uh, surveys after before and after this engagement process. They were all hugely enthused by the way that way of learning about science. They actually was they felt that 
the science was much more interesting when it was conveyed in a locally relevant and inspiring way uh, than when it was the way that they'd previously had that education. So a, a huge opportunity for engagement and building the, um, I guess, if you like, the political motivation, if I would be so grubby, of the next generation uh, of people who are actually going to go out and, um, and vote and purchase and consume in sustainable ways and, and try and do things that are, that are uh, biodiversity positive. Of course, there's a whole lot of other elements to political will. It's also about, um, about people uh, empowering or bottom-up uh, motivation for our parliaments and our leaders. Uh, and so I think we've got a huge opportunity now with the, the so-called green and teal wave that we've seen emerging uh, over the last couple of weeks. Uh, we're in the process of trying to set up something called the Biodiversity Council, which is a which is an independent um, authoritative uh, think tank about biodiversity along the lines of the Climate Council to provide frank and fearless advice about um, current failures and what the opportunities are to do better for biodiversity. So there's something I'm happy to chat with anybody about later. And of course, um, great to see Graham here today. Uh, thanks so much for this fa fabulous uh, independent review of the, of the EPBC Act. I think this was a case where we definitely had AD20. Uh, we, we were ready to go uh, and the government of the day just wasn't prepared to uh, go with the recommendations uh, from Graham's review. And so I think this is a huge opportunity now with the incoming government to actually see the implementation of the Samuels Review um, and the improvement of the effectiveness of the EPBC Act, which we all acknowledge is currently failing to protect um, biodiversity and, and our natural uh, heritage. Often I hear people talk about the resource problem. We've got a resource problem. I'm actually just... Um, I, I'm starting to realise that actually this talk about resources, yes, we are underfunded in terms of biodiversity conservation, in terms of land management. And indeed, in the, the recent Victorian Auditor General Office report, uh, that they indicated that funding available to protect threatened species falls significantly uh, short of what's needed. Our current spend nationally uh, targeted towards threatened species is only around $120 million a year. That's an average across a number of years. Um, overall environmental spending largely through the National Land Care Program, uh, drops out at about $250 million a year. And we've worked out that um, in order to actually save all of the threatened species on our list, we could do that with around $1.6 billion a year, um, and that this is, this, these are much more rubbery figures about nationally what we would need to uh, invest to actually improve environmental outcomes and this may sound like quite a lot of money, 1.6 or 2, .3, uh, 2 to $3 billion a year if you're thinking about threatened species or environmental management more broadly. So I just want to remind you that as a nation, last year we've spent $30.2 billion just on cats and dogs, just on pet care. So even just the GST from the money that we spend on pet care would be enough to cover our, uh, the, the conservation of our whole uh, list of threatened species in Australia. Um, so uh, I think that's a really crucial thing to remember. We can afford this. Um, and then, of course, there's, you know, uh, <laughs> money for nothing. So there's a whole bunch of reasons, I think, why we shouldn't see this as a resource problem. This is a problem of political will. This is a problem of, um, and political will comes from engagement. It comes from people motivating change in our polity. And so, uh, so let's get engagement right. Some great words already from Judith about business and nature. I just want to touch on a couple of things. There's a task force, force for nature related uh, risk disclosure. This is about uh, where businesses face risks from biodiversity loss and ecosystem collapse, much in the same way as the same disclosures have to be made where businesses face risk from climate change. Uh, we're seeing that start to develop now as an important motivation for businesses to understand their biodiversity risk. Um, and so uh, similarly, we've actually seen nearly 100 of the world's biggest finance organisations pledge uh, to biodiversity friendly finance. Uh, this is, you know, uh, $14.7 trillion worth of assets, uh, these companies pledging to do biodiversity positive investment. So this is a huge potential opportunity. But coming back to Judith's points, we need to be able to tell them what biodiversity positive is in simple terms. We need to be able to measure it so that they can report on it. All these companies who are eager to actually make this 
good change need to be helped with the really basic tools that we currently don't offer them. So there's this huge need, I think now, for us to sort out um, data, both in terms of, of the um, sort of Western scientific sense of data, but also knowledge and knowing and, and various other ways of providing evidence and measurement to help com companies demonstrate their biodiversity risk and their biodiversity performance. Um, and again, another quote from the, the Auditor General's report, we currently lack performance indicators and in reporting to demonstrate the impacts of management interventions on the decline of threatened species. So that comes from the Victorian Auditor General. Um, that signal is very clear. It was also very clear in the Samuel Review data and clear ways of measuring and providing that signal about what's going on in the environment and how we're helping or not helping is absolutely essential in the main gap. And uh, that's all for me now. Yeah. Thank you. We'll just take maybe one quick question of clarity, if anyone has a question of clarity for, for Brendan. Brilliant. Don't ask me what kind of cat that was, by the way. <laughs> that's fine. Um, are there any Australian firms that are signed up into the Finance for Biodiversity group? That is a really good question. I mean, all of them will have activity. All of the firms will have activities in Australia. It's Rabobank, it's AXA, it's these, the, you know, the really big uh, finance organisations. Judith may know, uh, although uh, if you go to the website that I probably should have put up on the slide, uh, you can find all the, the full list of the, of the uh, companies that are signed up. Uh, I haven't seen one, but I did, I did want to add to your comment on the task force for um, finance related yes. nature disclosures. Yes. It's only reached a um, pilot version of the framework this year, so very preliminary. Yep. Yeah, and I suspect the same might be true of the understanding that those lovely faces of leaders of banks and that, I wonder how many of them think about the impact of the, you know, the land on which the houses they fund and the businesses they fund. Yeah. I suspect there's a long way to go. Absolutely. But sort of, I guess that means a huge opportunity for us to get in early in these processes and make sure that they, they're measured correctly, that it's robust and it's not greenwashing. Uh, and so I think there's a, a big opportunity for all of us to do that front. Uh, uh, this is a beautiful segue to the panel. The, the fellows clearly want to be on the panel and have a conversation about this. And so if I could ask you to, well, first of all, let's thank Brendan. You all talked from a different perspective about solutions and already there are emergent patterns. And I, I will say that while our fellows have interacted and engaged actively in producing, helping to produce that draft, you didn't all compare your solutions and yet there were patterns. And so I felt that, really, so I perhaps we'll start maybe with you, Fern, but just move through. And I'd be interested to hear from each of the fellows and some people have asked about this too. How, how do you bring together some of the solutions you've suggested and do you see patterns in, in the way forward? So perhaps, Fern. Yeah, the patterns are really obvious, I think. There are many that I observed um, around improving the relationships and the work that we do with traditional owners and Aboriginal organisations. <coughs> there's some good work that's already happening, but clearly there's some opportunities to do more in that space. Um, there's clearly some patterns around um, the investment opportunities and not just the opportunities themselves, but how we link that back to people having a participatory role in supporting nature and the other link that that takes me to is the opportunity of participation by people on the ground in meaningful ways. Several people talked about people not knowing what they can do to make a difference. And, you know, one of the things that I had as a slight thought bubble perhaps was this idea of a nature knowledge network which answers some of those ideas. It's an idea where we also address the data connectivity issue. You know, one of the things that I observe is that sometimes we have parallel processes of people developing different answers around data happening in different organisations. So it would be great to see those things networked up and joined up so that those good minds come together earlier and share data sets earlier and answer some of those questions earlier. And that the gaps are clear to others who would like to participate, whether it's in a citizen science way or, or investment way 
or some other way in which people can participate and see the results, see the feedback, see the good news and the stories coming back about what their investment, whether it's in time, effort, money, advocacy, see the result of that coming back through that shared network. I'm glad you raised the Nature Knowledge Network and I will, we will keep going with the patterns, but uh, so someone did ask sp specifically in here, there's a couple of questions about that, who's in it? I mean, just to draw out the answer that you said before. Everyone like, who, who wants to be. Okay, right, okay. <laughs> so maybe we'll go, so patterns, Brendan, patterns in what you heard through solutions. Yeah, look, I think uh, Fern's done a great job in, in setting out the patterns. I've just written the four down that you note, and I think that would be a great uh, four tables. Uh, but, uh, but So yeah. say them out loud again so that well, we can well, get I, them on. I got here, um, I guess, uh, First Nations um, land management empowerment <laughs> um, and two-way learning uh, Yep. and uh, investment uh, yep. as, as an opportunity and that, that goes right across the board from, from how you and I invest our time tomorrow morning uh, through to how Rubber Bank um, decides mm -hmm. whether or not it's going to invest in a pulp mill or a coal mine. So I think there's, you know, there's a, a big story there about investment decision making. Uh, engagement and participation, um, and so people need to feel empowered. Uh, people need to have opportunities to act. Uh, they need to be able to be articulate about the problem and the opportunities when they're talking with their with their um, local members, for example. Um, and then, this, for me, I think I'm not sure if you exactly said it, but but there's this issue of measurement, transparency, robustness. It's the it's the evidence we give to a claim that a company is making a, an investment that's in environment and people. Uh, so how are we measuring those those um, claims? How are we reporting back? And even possibly how we how well the knowledge required to predict the benefits of an action before it's taken. I'm going to use that as a as a wonderful segue to you, Judith. And a bit before I ask you about the patterns. Do you, you proposed effectively, you know, when I buy my airline tickets, I buy the carbon credits, and you proposed effectively a, a banking mechanism similar to that. Um, do you feel like that, that robustness, that certification quality is there yet um, to be able to implement that? And then I'll get you to talk about patterns. The technology is there to be able to implement it, I'm pretty confident, mm -hmm. in terms of the, the banking technology. Um, the robustness to me comes in the selection of projects mm -hmm. and making sure that um, a trusted source has selected the project for you. Um, we, if I can just say, we're, we're very fortunate that our customers do trust us, so when we email our customer base about half cut, as I say, about one in 15 customers gave money. Yeah, wow. But, but it has to be a source that is recognised and trusted. In yeah, and sense. hence the comment you were saying, Brendan, about making sure that you can track that back to an actual biodiversity Absolutely. outcome. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if it's worth discriminating between cases where businesses just do something good for the environment because their shareholders or their, you know, want them to, and that's a good thing to do, and the case where businesses are just choosing the investment option that still brings a return, but is the lowest biodiversity impact or the highest uh, biodiversity positive yep. investment option. So they're both really important decisions. Um, but I guess we just, I think we need to get all, need to get away from the idea that, that doing good things for biodiversity is, is a charity. It's actually an investment in the future. It can grow capital and, and money and returns and be good for biodiversity. And I yep. think that's a crucial um, thing to work out. And, and, and that very much feeds into what I was talking about, a business case for a mm -hmm. biodiversity project that actually shows the returns. We, we do see these cases um, in terms of the agriculture that Uncle Dave was talking about and um, Ned's Corner, I think, uh, but they're agricultural based. So for a business that is purely retail mm. or banking or something like that, can, can we demonstrate something that has a, a lower negative impact or a positive impact in biodiversity that, that will relate to that business. Mm. It's different, slightly different issue. Mm. But in terms of mm. um, the common mm. themes, mm. the two things I, I would sort of add would be chunking things down into a manageable action for the groups, and that's something that everyone's really talked about so that you can get your head around what's going on. And the other one is uh, 
it's not something we've talked about, so I'm just going to throw out a challenge while I've got the chance. Mm. Um, this is a group of people who are pretty much on board with the importance of biodiversity, but you all belong to other groups. You know, you belong to your local sports club or your, your local rotary or something like that. You should be talking to those groups, not just to people who are already on board, and, and that would be very, very powerful. June, that give, is actually oh. one of the identified actions that we, uh, when we did expert elicitation and, and some research around what are the top actions that ordinary people can do to support nature. And of course there's things where you can volunteer for nature, you can do things on the ground, um, you can do <coughs> wildlife gardening, you can contain your pets, you can spend time in nature because there is evidence that spending time in nature is an absolute precursor to people caring for and acting for nature. But one of the others is be a champion for nature. Tell the good stories of nature. Infect other people with naturosity. So I just made that word up. It's a word, isn't it? That's a good word. I can just see the headline now. Can I, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come to you, Damien, for the last word on, on patterns. Already, you already had an offer from Judith for, to, for the bank to buy IPAs or fund them. I, I think I heard that. I'm not, no, no, sorry, I'm not trying to verbal you. Um, investigation of the option. Yeah, what were some of the patterns you saw? Um, the need for money and resources. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say... Um, to, to Judith from Bank Australia, thank you for picking Victoria to have the, um, the activity in. I mean, you have the rest of the continent that you picked here, which is really good and a good reflection of what we need to do here. Um, just sort of patterning things, um, I'm glad we're talking about investment instead of, instead of philanthropy. Um, I know philanthropy is uh, nice and good, um, but unfortunately uh, philanthropies have a couple of um, sort of... Uh, uh, how would you say, uh, they sort of weren't happy with their involvement with us down home because they don't really like philanthropy. I've got enough um, needs and expectations to look after from my own mob, let alone country, and philanthropy, some parts of philanthropy not having that, that, that understanding of that. Uh, but so to, to, to have that shift from philanthropy, which is still important, it's sort of just not for me at my cynical age, I think, uh, but investment is such a much more positive word to have. Um, the other, there's two other things I want to talk about patterns, um, uh, our generational patterns. Um, I, again, at my age, I've seen the climate change, I've seen the climate shift. Um, I, I live at Cape Bridgewater. Um, we had that, uh, we, we would be part of that rain belt that would come across uh, from Discovery Bay and flow into Mort Lake. That's not there anymore. It's, it's amazing uh, to see that within, um, you know, the 50 years of my life. Um, to see things like uh, Tay Rake Lake Conda, uh, we've restored it, but it's still got a long way to go. Um, water isn't there anymore. So that generational thing and that, again, that storytelling, um, what, what all of you, uh, Mob, can talk about the stories you have in your own, um, your own biodiversity, biodiversity history. Is, is important and we need to really engage that with the young people now so they can start um, um, collecting those stories within their own mind, mind, especially with the spread of um, uh, spread of urban development across everywhere, um, not just in Melbourne. Down home you see Warrnambool, um, uh, you see everywhere. Everywhere is just growing, that urban spread. Um, but so we need those ch those those children now to collect those stories about how they water waterways uh, are, uh, how they how how they've been affected, and hopefully how they've been fixed up as well as these people get older. There was a third one: um, investment, philanthropy, generation. Um, can we have some biodiversity projects? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't talked about that. We talk about investment, this and that, but to really um, pinpoint. Uh, what can be done. We have our threatened species, uh, we have our endangered species. Uh, we need to list and value our Aboriginal totemic species alongside that. Um, a lesson I've learnt from um, being on the Catchment Management Authority for oh, I've seen forever now is that the, and it's a strange thing, when they talk about waterway health, they talk about saving uh, the good waterways because that's all we have left. And we all sit there going, what? 
what do you mean? You've got to save them plus um, there's tributaries mm. that need saving into those, into the good waterways. So uh, to look at, um, at, at that philosophy um, uh, and that, that work as well, you know, and to take every, uh, every opportunity that we have um, down our way uh, with the Gundich Mara, we got we got rules. We got um, you know get the land back, then we'll fight about it. But get the land back in the first place, and that could be um, oh, I would love for it to be thirty thousand hectares like Ned's Corner. Um, yeah, we're talking about the Western Districts of Victoria, the, the original squatter sphere. Mm -hmm. um, uh, whatever we can get back, and whatever we can give to communities to look after, not only our own traditional owner communities, but um, school communities, um, land care groups, um, land care groups work on private land. I love for the uh, majority of private land. I love for them to have their own plots to work on biodiversity mm. um, and, and the authority to do that kind of stuff. Brilliant. I, um, I, yeah, w there's about 18 or so questions here, and in answering those, you actually. You've all covered about eight or nine of them. There are a couple that I do want to kind of, if it's all right, I'm actually going to go to someone in the audience to ask them, because all a, a number of you touched on the EPBC Act review and Graham sitting here, so I want to ask Graham, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you, I mean, it was a brilliant review. I, I found it both distressing and, and brilliant in its, in its suggestions. I'm going to ask you specifically, if you were the emperor for the day, you know, and, and you had the all-powerful thing, what two things would you fix first in that national framework? Um, that's not fair, because they're not two. OK. <laughs> right. I'm, I, how about, I'll give you three. So, so let me give you a very quick reaction. First of all, I want to say this. Uncle Dave, you were so right about, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Indigenous science. And that's chapter two of the report. Yep. It's the chapter about which I'm perhaps most passionate, because it's the one where we are symbolic, um, we give lip service to Indigenous science and we let ourselves down so much. 70,000 years of science, we'll, yeah, we ignore it. Uh, and, and so, Uncle Dave, thank you for that. Um, you know, I really, and, and it's, it's been very interesting to see each of the panellists focus on Indigenous engagement and it is one of the low-hanging fruits that Brendan's referred to. So I do that, number one. Number two, and this, this is partly going to answer your question, um, Rob, I don't entirely agree with you about frustration at the end of the day. Um, I think the frustration ceased in part Saturday a week ago because um, what happened then was that we got a government that said we believe in the environment, we believe in climate change, we're going to do something about it. We've got two ministers, Chris Bowen and Tanya Plibersek, heading up one of the largest departments in this whole area, and they'll deal with the whole lot. And, and uh, you know, I'm very encouraged by the Prime Minister's comments, both in the election, um, at the election, but also when this review was announced, when he said to the government, this is, it's his words, by the way, an outstanding review, for God's sake, just adopt it. Yeah. Right. So, so, so that's that. Now, in terms of the things to do, I think Brendan actually, you know, and, and I respect everything that all the panellists have said, but Brendan actually hit upon the low, low hanging fruit. And there is so much that can be done um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, Brendan talked about political will. I think that's the important thing. What we've now got is political will. We didn't have it before, you know, to my intense frustration. Um, uh, as Brendan noted, the 80-20 rule, it was the rule that, that, that we applied in gathering together 19 groups from the Business Council, the Minerals Council, Petroleum, academics, scientists, conservation groups, Indigenous groups, and they were all drawn together. And one of the first things I said at the first meeting, as Brendan will, 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 will affirm, you'll never get 100%. If you're happy with 80%, that's better than nothing. So let's agree on 80%. And when the review came out, the emails and the texts that I got which said, thank you, this is what we wanted, this is it, with two exceptions, and I'll mention them, I'm going to name them, West Australian Chamber of Mines, who said, if you adopt the review, you'll get no more mining in West Australia. That was bollocks, a load of utter rubbish, but they got to... The, the Premier at the time, and he then got to the Prime Minister. That's why nothing's happened on the review. And the other one was the extraordinary one from National Farmers Federation, who said, what's in it for us? And my response was to say, it's not what's in it for you. This is about what's in it for the environment, so long as we can do it in a way that doesn't cause you any significant disadvantage. 
But they didn't want that. They wanted something in it for them. Now, the, 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 the areas, and this is where I'm going to give you some hope, um, is that business is now on board. Business Council, Dutton has described them as woke rubbish. You know, the Business Council, led by Tim Reid and, and Jennifer Westacott, are totally on board with this. And uh, Tim is working with us in another area in terms of the integration of climate change and carbon credits, carbon emissions with, with um, uh, you know, the issues of biodiversity. And they are very much interrelated. You know, when one talks about clearing forests, clearing land, deforestation, et cetera, then you know, if, if I have one area where I'd be focusing on, that'd be one. Two would be the indigenous engagement issue. It is so important. I said there wasn't going to be limited to two, uh, and you probably won't limit to 10 minutes either. Um, uh, but, You've but, got 30 seconds. Right, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, the third one, I think, would be to put in place a, main, a mandate, mandated hierarchy. Avoid mitigate and then look at offsets. Whereas currently what occurs is we have offsets, number one, we don't worry about avoiding, we don't worry about mitigating, right? And the result is then the offsets are done in a really, really poor way. Um, uh, you know, they, they are ignored largely and, they don't, and they're not quality offsets. Uh, the other thing, the 1800 threatened species, we've got conservation advices in respect of nearly 1800, Brendan, we've got recovery plans, no one could tell me, but it is so small, it doesn't matter. And the recovery plans that are there are not funded, they're ignored, nothing happens. So if you want to do something about biodiversity, address not just the conservation of advices, but start focusing on recovery plans and we'll get there. The final thing I'll say is this is that I've seen business on side. You know, several years ago, I was on the ANU Council and chaired its finance committee. And we talked then about selling down certain stocks that were, were involved in fossil fuels. We got hammered by the financial review, hammered by it over this, this outrageous approach that we're going to do and diminish returns, et cetera, none of which was, was going to happen. The financial review now every day has at least one or two articles on ESG. I know because mm -hmm. I copy them and I put them to my ESG folder. It's the largest folder I've got in my, my computer. ESG is there, right? Environmental, uh, social and governance. And it's now become the accepted standard for many, many companies. A lot of them are talking the talk. They're yep. not necessarily walking it, but that's right. It'll come with the leadership of the business council and the like, we, we will be there. And that's where all this becomes relevant. If I was to do one thing, Take what Brendan's done in his slides and just take that low-hanging fruit. Thank you. And, and I'm going to um, – there is actually – it's a great segue too for the final kind of question that I, I, I do you, – you, a number of you did touch on it, and that's about directors and directors' disclosures and the kind of – and how you actually can get focused investment. And I realise that – I know, Judith, you mentioned that the, the, the task force on nature-related financial disclosure is, is still maturing. And we've got someone – Gordon Noble, you're in the room, yeah. So, And you've been involved in that maturity process. And before I come back to you about directors and disclosures, could you give us – yeah, a minute and a half update on where that process is at on that maturing of that yeah. how close is it is to being in directors kind of you know yeah KPIs. Look, absolutely and look as background i uh i was a co-author of the australian sustainable finance roadmap so all the stuff about esg graham's talked about is is my space and 100 percent agree with that uh biodiversity for finance no australian organizations yet on that should be uh, you look out the room and you can look at uh, a big industry super fund building a skyscraper, so no problems about allocating capital, so that's a massive opportunity. Where TNFT is going, it's Australian government did sign up to it, so that's the good thing. The, there's a thing called the G20 Sustainable Finance Working Group. Now, this is a working group co-chaired by China uh, and the US and includes all the financial system regulators. They're backing TNFD. So TNFD is, is coming down the pipeline and it's coming down fast. What it's going to mean in terms of um, the, the finance system that, uh, around us is ultimately we're going to move from disclosure to we're going to move to financing. And I think that's, the, that's a real opportunity here. So, uh, Brendan, those, those list of uh, members of, the, of the, you know, the, um, the biodiversity, the finance for biodiversity, they will buy a bond tomorrow. They will buy, 
anything that is is issued at scale into the market, there's appetite for globally. We've got over three trillion in our superannuation funds. We've got appetite here as well. So absolutely, TMT is is coming. As, as we're talking about, it's immature at the moment, um, and I think this is the issue with the task force. It's the one thing we wrote with the Australian Sustainable Finance uh, Working Group was uh, the um, the roadmap is that the the skills in the in the finance sector will always need the skills in 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 the in biodiversity. They don't have that in the finance sector, and they never will because the skills, the depth of skills around finance, so uh, around creating bonds, around creating products, etc. So we need those partnerships. We need the partnerships between the science and finance, and I think that's a massive opportunity. Thanks, hey, for thanks, that Gordon. And maybe yeah, I was going to ask uh, you to pick that up. Can I just add, thank thank you, Gordon, for that. Um, one of the points I've sort of been making throughout this progress program it is if there is a trading and an investment opportunity, the mechanisms for that will evolve very, very quickly. Finance people are very good at finding all sorts of ways of making money um, from whatever comes. But what is needed is the projects that actually address the issue. Yeah. Um, so, so that's the first step. Don't worry about the finance sector developing a bond or something that, you know, ratchets up when certain targets are achieved. They can do that on their head. Um, but worry about the projects that actually demonstrate a business case, something investable in, something giving, I hate to say, giving a return. And to add to that, um, say with the renewable sector, um, which is deadly, we've got to reduce emissions and all that. But for that renewable infrastructure, how that's going to fit across my country, I know it's going to have an impact um, on biodiversity, on country, on water. Um, how do we offset, how do we offset the offsets? <laughs> Given that you just mentioned offsets, I was going to go, do, oh, do, an, yeah. do you <laughs> want to just say anything about offsets, knowing that it's something that you do have some views on? Right, yeah, I, I am a bit upset about offsets, but it's, it's, um, it's really just, I think, as Graham said, we've just got to get the rules right. I mean, yep. there are going to be projects where it's public good, we have to have it, and we've explored all of the alternatives and possibilities to make it biodiversity positive, and we get to the point where there's going to be some environmental harm. You know, it would, we'd be living in la la land to think that that's not ever going to happen with good regulation, etc. So, um, but it's as you know, as you said, it's on its head at the moment. It's offsetting is basically a license to harm, yep. And, yep. Uh, yep. and so we need to flip that uh, yep. and make it. As it was originally designed, we, you know, with respect to the people, you know, possibly even in the room who were part of some of the original design, it was clearly meant to be used in a strict regulatory framework where, you know, it was the very last resort. And then when you did offset, you actually had some robustness around um, how much to make to mm. try and compensate. Some things weren't offsetable, you know, the mm. last of the last, that sort of thing. Mm. And, and it should be the same for, for uh, things of high cultural value. They just shouldn't be offsetable. Uh, but, you know, uh, and, and then there's this concept of do we ensure that you accrue the biodiversity benefit before you can liquidate somewhere else? So, so have the biodiversity bank as a savings bank rather than a, you know, a credit card that you yeah. drunkenly wander yep. around and sort of spend left, right and centre. So I think there's, you know, some, a few things that we can do so that offsets isn't such a dirty word. It's clearly it makes sense in, in where you're offsetting carbon or methane molecules, oh, you, you know, and I think we can do with that. that. There's a whole lot uh, of places the where The exchange you is, is, you know, it's fully fungible, but but it's it, unfortunately at the moment in biodiversity it's not. And it, I mean, just picking up this too, it, it's been very powerful in the circular economy. I mean, the, the whole, what was previously known as the waste hierarchy is flipped the right way and is driving an entire circular economy investment pathway. So that, so that, you know, there's methods at work and other things that we can bring in. Um, Fern, did you have any kind of final reflections on the basis of the conversations we've been having about, A, the, the federal kind of mandating pathways, but also some of the director's stuff? Or something else. I was going somewhere else in my Go mind, actually. <laughs> kind of drawing a lot of those things together and thinking about um, the comments we've been hearing about investment and a tangible project and IPAs. And you know, one of the things we've been talking about is instead of us doing you know, discrete projects around different impacts or issues or whatever they might be in a biodiversity space, 
that instead we have as our starting point country plans. Mm -hmm. And that the work uses the country plan as the foundation for what we do in place. And that that informs everything. And that could become a really powerful way of creating biodiversity projects, if you like, that have multiple layers of meaning for different people and different parts of society as well, and could provide really tangible investment opportunities for, for people. So I wasn't thinking specifically about oh, the direct right. thing, but I was thinking about the opportunities that lie in that space. Well, look, given that you've said if we can do one thing, there it is, I'll come back through each of you. If you could do one thing, what would you like to do, Brendan? Oh, look, this is probably a bit of a step sideways from where we've been. I'd do Fern's thing, absolutely. I think that sounds brilliant. Um, couch everything in the context of the country plan. Investments that you want to make need to be in the context of the country plan. I think planning is really important. Another thing that came out of Graham's review pretty clearly. Mm. Um, we also need to set some ground rules, I think, and we haven't talked much about regulation and it seems to be a bit of a dirty word and maybe it's a boring topic, but um, we actually have to have ground rules about what's allowable and what's not allowable um, and, it, and we need to in, have enforcement of those uh, ground rules and at the moment we just don't. Uh, and that's something that I really hope we see uh, improved in, yep. in a new government that we actually have resourcing of the groups that actually have to enforce the very basic rules. You can't go in and illegal, illegally clear a, a critically endangered grassland in Western Victoria just because you're the Minister of Agriculture and get away with it. So it's, there's some really basic things we need to do. Yep. One thing? I'd take a, progr pro a program like this to the Business Council of Australia and challenge each of the members to have on their staff um, a couple of researchers who would identify, firstly, the impact that their activities are having on biodiversity, and then, secondly, a number of projects that could avoid or mitigate not offset, <laughs> uh, that impact. So I'd do that um, straight away. I think Fern's plan is great, but it sounds to me like it's going to take time, and I think you need to do other things as well. So this project to the Business Council of Australia, but make them actually act on their commitment, because that's that's the gap. Damien, last word, one thing. Um, cast the net wide. Um, with this project here, it's it's there to drive biodiversity tw uh, 2037. Um, I remember 20 years ago when, we, uh, when our community, um, we come out of liquidation, we lost about three commercial farms, we're on our arse end down there. We had to sit down and work out what we wanted to do as Gunditjmara people with our cultural assets, with our future. Um, and we sat down, we dreamed big. Uh, we said national heritage, we said world heritage. We, re we said restore Tay Rake Lake Conda um, after being drained for 50 years. Uh, we wanted knowledge networks. We wanted education. We wanted the capacity of our people. We wanted our people to be rangers, to be there for country. Um, a lot of people said, you idiots, what are you doing to yourselves? You're going to set yourself up for more disappointment. Um, hello, 20 years later, we've done all that. Welcome to country. So when we talk about be brave, be fucking brave. All right? <laughs> As always, the, the, the brilliant last word. Why don't we finish by um, thanking our fellows for the thought-provoking um, conversation. <laughs>